Welcome back to the One Year Bible Journey, especially for beginners. I'm Pastor Kerry. This is Growing in the Gospel, and welcome to week two to the New Testament reading for this week. Today, or this week, we're reading Matthew 6 through 10. So yesterday we talked about Genesis 16 to 30, and now we're moving into the New Testament. And I hope that the Old Testament, New Testament reading simultaneously in the same week isn't throwing you too much. Um, I hope actually as we go forward, it's going to balance out a little bit of the hard parts of the Old Testament. (laughs) You'll, You'll get a little bit of respite as you turn to your New Testament reading for that week. First of all, I want to say, hey, good job. Uh, you're in week two already. You're, I don't even know what person, you're one fifty second of, two fifty seconds of the way there. So good job. Stick with it. Don't be discouraged. Don't turn this into a stick to beat yourself with. If you miss a week, just start back up. Uh, try to catch back up if you want to, but if you can't, don't worry. Just work through it slowly if you need to. Um, so, Your assignment for this week, we talked about Genesis 16 to 30. The next part of the reading is Matthew 6 through 10 and Psalm 4 through 6, and those are easy. So last week we talked about Matthew 1 through 5, the the book of Matthew, the person of Matthew, the audience for Matthew, the topic of Matthew validating, proving, presenting, and telling the story of Jesus as the king, as the the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, the one that God's been promising all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. From the beginning of time, this has all been about Jesus. And now when we get to Matthew, and you're going to see this in all the Gospels, God has arrived. He is here. Jesus, to bring a long story into clear focus, Jesus was born. He grew up in Nazareth, northern Israel, Galilee. Nazareth is a city that's built into the hills that look south and west across the Valley of Megiddo, across the Valley of Jezreel, it's also called. So it's a steep, out-of-the-way village. He grew up with probably less than a couple hundred people learning how to do carpentry work, which in New Testament era was more about stones and rock than it was about uh, about wood. So Jesus worked with his father, Joseph, and around his 30th birthday, he begins his ministry, his earthly ministry. He is baptized by John the Baptist. He is then driven into the wilderness to face temptation and goes up to Jerusalem, drives the money changers, the religious leaders out of the temple. So like the very beginning of his ministry, they already hate him. And then journeys back north. And he travels back to Jerusalem a number of times. He travels a number of different places. We'll maybe do that in one of our geography videos. He crosses over the Jordan and across the Sea of Galilee time or two he goes north up into the area of dan and mount hermon um caesarea philippi that's called he goes up to tyre and sidon which is the coast of lebanon he spends some time in the wilderness out near jericho um he but here's what i want you to know about the life and ministry i should say the three-year ministry of jesus Give or take the first eight months, he is he starts out up north, then goes south to Jerusalem, the baptism, the temptation, and then he travels up. This is in early in John. He travels up through Samaria, and then he goes back to Capernaum. Well, six to eight months in, give or take, he home bases, not in Nazareth, his hometown, because they want to kill him. There, some of them marvel, but some of them are they're just angry that, that little Jesus is claiming to be God. So he lands in a little village called Capernaum, which is on the very northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. The ruins of Capernaum are a wonderful place to visit. And at some point during the journey through the Gospels, I'll do a video about the geography of the Gospels 
and I'll share some pictures of some of these places. So we'll put that on the back burner for now. <clears throat> but he, he, he makes this his hometown, essentially, right there on the North Shore of Galilee. And he ministers in or out of or around Capernaum and Galilee for the better part of 18 months to two years. He's got about a three-year ministry, and there's a bit of time where he goes out of the region. But for the lion's share of two years of that earthly ministry, he's right there in or near Capernaum. At one point, he pronounces judgment on the cities of Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum. And there's a, there's a, that's a triangle. Capernaum is on the north shore of Galilee. Bethsaida is just about four miles away on the northeast shore of the Sea of Galilee. And Chorazin is up the hill looking down on Bethsaida and Capernaum. It's a city that was set up on the hill going up into the upper Galilee. The ruins of Chorazin are very interesting to see. They've been very well excavated. Um, my last time there, I was able to tour the ruins of Bethsaida and then walk the trail, not Bethsaida, Chorazin, tour the ruins of Chorazin and then walk the trail from Chorazin down to Capernaum. There's a lot of parts of Israel today that you can't even really see uh, because of the tension, but when you could go there as a tourist, a lot of parts of the of the country have been built up. A lot of the sites have been built up, and they're you know owned by different parts of the Catholic Church, or they're built up by different you know they're turned into tourist destinations. But there's a lot of places that are undeveloped and basically untouched. What's amazing about Bethsaida, Chorazim, and Capernaum. It's one of the most beautiful parts of the country, and it is not occupied. It has been left desolate to this very day, just as Jesus pronounced judgment. It, and it, there's no rational reason why these regions should be barren like this, but it's beautiful rolling hills on the Sea of Galilee, and it's just ancient ruins, and very few people really even go to Chorazin. But taking that walk, so that's one of the places where you could say, yeah, Jesus walked here. And it's a dirt trail, and you're walking over rock and crossing over little streams and walking past ancient sheepfolds. And, I mean, it's, it's quite an experience to walk that land where you know Jesus made this journey. The reason I tell you about these three cities in this region of Galilee is that for two years Jesus ministers in this region. And it's exactly what Isaiah predicted when he said the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali. We'll talk about the tribes and the locations and all of that later, but the region of Zebulun and Naphtali is exactly Jesus' hometown, Nazareth, and his hometown, Capernaum. It's the north shore of Galilee. It's also called Galilee of the Gentiles because this is the cross of a major intersection coming from the north, a major trade route down the Jericho, uh, the, the Jordan River Valley towards Jericho. Major trade intersection. If they're going to go, everyone coming from Africa or Arabia is going to come to this intersection on the north shore of Galilee. Everyone. And they're going to go up the northern Galilee and then they're going to either going to go east into Asia and the Far East, or they're going to go west towards Asia Minor and towards what we know today as Europe. There is a cross section. There's an intersection right here where Jesus planted himself for three years. And this is why Jeremiah, Isaiah said the people that walked in darkness, because this is a desolate place. This is where the Assyrian army invades and wipes out the northern kingdom. It becomes the place of the Gentiles. It's often called Galilee of the Gentiles. But this fork in the road, this intersection, is, is you could say it's the intersection of, of the entire known world. 
So whatever happens in this place is going to be, it's going to quickly spread to every corner of the populated world. So Jesus goes there. And Isaiah said, a great light has dawned. And as you unfold that prophecy of Isaiah, the idea is that just elation and celebration and amazing glory and visitation, a miraculous visitation of God was going to happen on this land. And that is exactly what Jesus did for two years. And that's why he pronounced judgment, because many believe, but many, many, many people after two years of watching the most amazing spectacle, the most supernatural, spectacular, and marvelous demonstration of the power of God on planet Earth through the person of Jesus takes place in two years in this region. And it's unbelievable. It's amazing. When you read the Gospels, and you're going to be reading uh, the end of the Sermon on the Mount and the beginning of some spectacular healings by Jesus and really miracle-working things. Here's what I want you to know. The Gospels, and John says this, the Gospels can only give you vignettes. They can only give you samples, little bits and pieces, little, little examples of what Jesus did. But John said, there's no way that all the books on the world in the world could contain all the things that Jesus did. All the miracles, all the mighty works, all the words. So we get but a portion. And the idea that God wants us to see and have. And I grew up thinking the other way. I grew up thinking that the, that Jesus didn't heal most people, but he healed some. No. That's wrong. Jesus healed tens and tens and tens of thousands of people. He healed. There's one night in Capernaum, he stayed up all night and he healed everybody in the region, everybody that came to him. He put the entire medical industry out of business in one night, stayed up all night, worked through the night, healing, blessing. He feeds people by the thousands. He heals people by the thousands. He teaches them in large gatherings and experiences he explains to them what the heart of God is really like, the generosity, the love, the lavish light and grace and mercy, the generosity of the heart of God. Jesus just pours out love, pours out grace, pours out mercy. Goodness, goodness, goodness. I mean, he is just a Niagara Falls of goodness for two years, three total, but two years in Capernaum and in this region. And I just, I just, I don't even think I can say it right. As you're reading the gospels, you need to bask in the lavish love that Jesus is unfolding. It is unbelievable. I mean, it's, it's believable, but I mean, I use that, that term in a, you know, as hyperbole. It, it's, it's just mind blowing. It is heart melting. As you, as you read Matthew, as you read Mark and Luke and John, do your best to read slowly. Do your best to, to think. Don't try to rush through it. Drink it in. Meditate, consider, think on. Let this play out. Put yourself in the, in the stand in these people's place. The blind, the demonic, demon-possessed, the dead, the hungry, the poor, the outcast, the sinful, the broken. You're going to read about all these interactions and they're just vignettes. They're just little bits and pieces. This is like walking around Costco and sampling little things when you're hungry, just getting little tastes. When I go to Costco, I don't, I don't shop. I just eat little samples of stuff and it's so good. I want to buy it all. Jesus came to show us the glory of God to the very best that he could through a human body. The true glory of God would incinerate us, right? No, he's showing us the heart and the generosity and the lavish love, and grace and mercy. And he is so, so wonderful. So let me talk to you about um, five, six, and seven. And I think you should go back maybe and read five because five, six, and seven are the Sermon on the Mount. Three full chapters on the teaching of Jesus 
And to a first century Israelite, it would have been absolutely like, first of all, captivating. This is Jesus with droves of people up on a hillside up above Capernaum, overlooking the Sea of Galilee. It would have been a beautiful moment. And these people are all gathered around him in multitudes and multitudes. And he sits them down and he begins to teach. And Matthew and the people denote this, that they teach, he teaches differently than the religious leaders. These are people that have been steeped in religion their whole lives. And it's a perversion of truth. And it's a perversion of God's heart. The religious systems of Jesus' day, Judaism, are like the religious systems of our day. They're, they pervert the heart of God. They're legalistic. They're performance-based. They turn God's love into cheap love. He only loves you when you're good. And you're earning your salvation. You're earning your way. You're paying your way. This is what Old Testament and, and early New Testament Judaism was, it, what it became. It became laws that were impossible to keep man-made, controlled by hypocrites, Pharisees, Sadducees, religious leaders, priests, high priests, lawyers, scribes, this whole religious uh, enterprise had become a machine. It had become market. Uh, it, it was a it was a market driven thing and it was it was extortion. It was criminal it was a criminal cartel. It was a criminal enterprise. And it was incredibly lucrative because they had oppressed and brought the people into bondage to monetary offerings, to blood sacrifices, to the, the system had become monetized in a corrupt way. Okay, there's nothing wrong with earning money. There's nothing wrong with making money and using it honorably. God created these things and he wants us to use our resources for his glory and for his kingdom. And and, but but the love of money and the corruption of money and power had just congealed and had gone far from God. Um, and Jesus, as he begins his earthly ministry for three years, he's going to, you're going to see two things. He's going to love the poor, the outcast, the broken, the weak, the hurting. They're going to be magnetized to him. He's going to be absolutely attracted to them. And he is going to confront like a pit bull, like a bull in a china shop, he's going to run right over the religious cartel and destroy. He's going to break down, discredit, confront, condemn the organized perversion and exploitation of the people that God loves. Jesus is, is tender and fierce. He is tender towards failed, flawed, needy, desperate, repentant people and he is fierce and, and strong and firm and confrontational towards hypocrites, towards religious hypocrisy and religious oppression and religious legalism. And I will define legalism quickly for you, and then I must, I must bring this to a close. Legalism is I'm saved by my works or I am staying saved by my works or I'm earning the favor of God, I'm leveraging the blessing of God by my works, I'm relating to God and to my fellow man on the basis of my performance for God. My goodness, that's legalism. And it comes in many forms. But it is, it is on the hardest edge, I'm saved by my works. And on the softest edge, no, I'm just relating to God on the basis of my works. And, and, and I'm trying to leverage and exploit God's blessing by my good works, by my performance. Or maybe I'm trying to pay off my salvation or somehow earn, somehow earn God's favor by living up to good works. Now, my friend, that's legalism. And it's bondage, it's slavery. And Jesus came to deliver us from that. Legalistic, legalistic thinking is, it might, it'll say something like this. I know a lot of gospel believers are legalistic. Legalistic is, okay, I'll, get, I'll grant you salvation by grace, salvation by grace. But just because you relate to God on the basis of grace doesn't mean I'm not going to relate to you on the basis of your works. So 
legalistic is let's relate to each other on the basis of who's doing the best, who's doing the most, who's the best among us. And the followers of Jesus since the first century have been plagued by legalism and legalistic thinking. Jesus is going to confront organized religion. He's going to confront legalism. He's going to confront performance-based living. And he's going to do his best over three years to show us we can never relate to God on the basis of our goodness before salvation or after salvation. We only relate to God on the basis of his goodness, his mercy. It is only by mercy. We are always operating in mercy, out of grace, out of the goodness of Jesus. And if there's anything good about us, it is Jesus in us doing that goodness. So even then we can't take credit for it. So the ultimate gospel-shaped life, grace-based life, is what Jesus is going to demonstrate, teach about, and go to the cross to reclaim so that we can relate to God on the basis of, of, of his goodness and on the basis of grace and mercy and not on the basis of works. But that is counter. It is polar opposite. It is absolutely in opposition to the organized religion of Jesus' day. So what you're going to read is Jesus in the, in the Sermon on the Mount tearing down all in a shocking one, you know, three chapter, one sermon, shocking delivery. He just, he condemns everybody guilty. And he goes subject by subject, your salt and light and how he's fulfilled the law and anger and murder and lust and adultery and divorce and remarriage and, and oaths and eye for an eye and loving your enemies and giving to the needy and how to pray and how to fast and putting your treasures in heaven and seeking first the kingdom and not worrying and not judging and asking and seeking and knocking and, uh, and, 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 and all of these topics, let me give you an example. Jesus talks about divorce and remarriage. He's confronting the Pharisees who were writing bills of divorcement. If your wife burned dinner, it was their way of having their way sexually, but still, quote, somehow keeping their religious laws. It was hypocritical. And so in every one of these topics, he's pressing, he's breaking through religion and performance and whitewashed exterior. He's, he's pressing through the law keeping, the, the technical law keeping, and he's driving to the heart of our sin and our impure motivation and our inside corruption. And he's, and he's showing us we don't need more laws. We need mercy. Because when you read the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, you don't come away going, I've done that. And you don't come away going, I can do that. You come away thinking, uh-oh, I haven't done that. I can't do that. And then you cry out for mercy and you trust that Jesus in you can do that. So a, a religious view of chapters 5, 6, and 7 would say, go do this. But you can't. And then you'll try and you'll fail. And then you'll try harder and you'll fail worse. And eventually that pattern of trying and trying harder and failing and trying harder and trying harder and failing, eventually that pattern eats you alive and flattens you and crushes you. And eventually you collapse in despair and you grow angry at God because his demands are too high and you can't live up to them. And then you quit and you blame God because you didn't realize he wasn't he didn't want you to try it wasn't about your performance it wasn't about it's never about your performance for him it's about his performance for you and then in you and through you his performance his work we are his workmanship so a gospel view of the sermon on the mount is this is god's original idea this is god's standard of living this is what creation and life was supposed to be. This is the inside out. This is kingdom life, but I failed it. I failed, but Jesus fulfilled it. This is what Jesus did perfectly, and Jesus can forgive me, and because of the cross and the empty tomb, he can come into me and give me new life and new birth. You see, I don't need a, I don't need a makeover. I need a new heart. 
I don't need um, improved laws or better boundaries. I need a new heart that doesn't want to break the laws. I need a new heart that more intuitively and naturally desires to live the way Jesus would live. I need a new spirit. I need the indwelling of God's spirit. I need God himself to come into me and change the way I think and feel so that my living right organically grows out of me and I'm hard. I'm not even trying, okay? See, the, the growth that God wants to do in your life is not you working at it. It's you availing yourself of transformational resources, the presence of God, the spirit of God, the word of God, like you're doing in this program. And those resources by the spirit of God organically transforming you from the inside out and new motives grow and new desires grow and a new will and a new way of thinking and a new way of living organically grows up. It just shows up. The most real true growth in your life is not the growth you work at. It's the growth you don't even know is happening. The Sermon on the Mount is not a stick to measure yourself by or to beat yourself with. So don't go either way. If you try to measure, look, oh, look how good I am. That's the wrong road. Or look how bad I am. I failed. I give up. That's the wrong road. No, it's God's ideal, yes, but it's accessible only through Jesus. It will materialize in your heart only over the course of your life as you yield to him day by day. So Jesus is tearing down religion, hypocrisy, phoniness, flippancy, legalism. He's relieving you and me and the followers, the believers of the burden of legalism, the bondage of performance-based acceptance. And he's calling us to embrace the restfulness of grace. He's inviting the flawed, the broken, the sinful, those that know they need mercy from a life of external performance to a life of internal love and worship-driven growth. It's not a performance-driven life. It's a love-driven life. And Jesus is laying out kingdom values as a, like, yeah, this is Sermon on the Mount. Here's what you think when you read it. You're like, I know I'm not that person. But you also think, but I want to be that person. That's the person I want to be. The thing is, if you try and try and try in your own strength, you'll fail and then you'll quit. But if you realize it's only by grace and mercy and only the presence and the hand and the work of Jesus, the grace of Jesus can bring this to reality in your life. Now you're thinking right. So I have to quit. Man, this is so fun though. Matthew 8, 9, 10. You're going to read about all this healing and all this amazing and wonderful and lavish loving work that Jesus does. So many critical verses, so many amazing things couple of key passages I want you to check and follow. Matthew 9, 12 to 13. They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. What's he saying? I don't need your performance. Sacrificial system, law keeping was never supposed to be about your performance. I want to have mercy. And the sacrificial system was supposed to point you to the idea that you need mercy. You need forgiveness. So Jesus says, I didn't come for the well-behaved or the good people. I came for the broken people, the sinful people, which is all of us, by the way. But so many are unwilling to admit that they need a Savior. And that's who he was talking to. Matthew 9, 35 to 38 Jesus goes about all the villages, all the cities, teaching, preaching this gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness, every, do you see it? Every disease among the people. He's moved with compassion because they're scattered as sheep that have no shepherd. I want you to see the shepherdly heart of Jesus by contrast to the browbeating, driving, oppressive heart of the religious cartel. And modern religion is the same today. It's just as oppressive. It's just as cold and cruel and heartless and um, and abusive, frankly. By Matthew 10, you're going to read about Jesus sending forth the 12 to minister 
talking to them and teaching them that once they believe, that's great, but now we're going to follow. Now we're going to talk about discipleship. Now we're going to talk about what it's going to cost us, what we're going to sacrifice if we really do follow Jesus with our whole life. One more key verse I want to point out. Matthew 10, 38 through 39. He that takes not his cross, followeth after me, is not worthy of me. He that finds his life shall lose it. He that loses his life, for my sake, shall find it. Life, the word is suke. It's your inner life, your inner sense of self. It's your soul life, your mind, your will, your emotions. The modern word is identity. What Jesus is saying is, I know who you really are. I know why I put you here. So don't try to define yourself. Don't try to look to the world for definition or anybody else. Jesus says, lose your life, lose your psyche, suke. Lose your inner self, your inner sense of identity. Lo- abandon your right to individual self-expression or self-identification. Lose yourself to me and I'm going to reveal your true self. I wrote a book about that. It's called Stop Trying, How to Receive, Not Achieve Your Real Identity. And I would encourage you to read it because it unpacks that whole idea of what was Jesus saying when he said, if you lose your life to me, you're going to find your, your life, yourself. But if you, if you try to keep yourself and find yourself and save yourself, define yourself, you're never going to find it. Why do I tell you about that? Because the, mo- the, the identity conversation is, is mainstream right now in our modern culture. And we need to understand Jesus spoke to it 2,000 years ago. So my friend, that is your overview of Matthew 6 through 10. You have a wonderful Savior. If you've never trusted Him, I hope you'll trust Him today. Enjoy your reading. Post your comments. Share what you're learning. Throw out your questions. I would love to be able to engage those questions. I'll do my best to answer them. If I don't have an answer, I'll tell you I don't know. But I think you're going to enjoy this week's reading. Tomorrow, I'm going to post a video called The Geography of Genesis. We're going to explore some maps and some photos. We're just going to talk about the lay of the land that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and one day Jesus is going to travel. And so I hope you'll watch that geography video because it will fill in some visuals for all the things that you're reading in God's Word. This is week two. Let's press on. You can do this. You've got this. Hey, there's still time to invite somebody to take the journey. Take care.